The very word secrecy is repugnant in a free and open society. And we are, as a people, inherently and historically opposed to secret societies, to secret oaths, and to secret proceedings. For we are opposed around the world by a monolithic and ruthless conspiracy that relies primarily on covet means for expanding its sphere of influence. It is a system which has conscripted vast human and material resources into the building of a tightly knit, highly efficient machine that combines military, diplomatic, intelligence, economic, scientific, and political operations. Its preparations are concealed, not published. Its mistakes are buried, not headlined. Its dissenters are silenced, not praised. No expenditure is questioned, no rumor is printed, no secret is revealed. I am not asking your newspapers to support an administration, but I am asking your help in the tremendous task of informing and alerting the American people. For I have complete confidence in the response and dedication of our citizens whenever they are fully informed. You want answers? I think I'm entitled. You want answers? I want the truth! You can't handle the truth! Previously in my video, What is the Mark of the Beast? Part 1, we answer the three following questions. What is the Mark of the Beast? Where does the Mark of the Beast come from? How do we avoid the mark of the beast? However, in What is the Mark of the Beast Part 2, we are going to focus on the question, Who is the beast? When answering this question, we will take a look at a variety of variables surrounding the actual question. The answers alongside of proof circulating this question are so abundant as well as detailed that it would be virtually impossible for me to cover them all in just one video of this nature and time frame. Nevertheless, it is my goal that you are presented with undisputable facts regarding this truth so that you may completely understand what the mark of the beast is. By the end of this video, if you have viewed part one of this video, you should be able to accurately comprehend the beast as well as the mark that is spoken of in Revelation. Let's begin. The word or name, Pope, literally translates to mean Father. The Pope is the Bishop of Rome as well as the world leader of the Catholic Church. He is also the head of the Vatican. Vatican City is the smallest country in the entire world. It's encircled by a two-mile border and is governed as an absolute monarchy with the Pope at its head. 
He is credited as the Apostle Peter's successor and is permitted to speak infallibly when he chooses to speak ex cathedra, which literally means from the chair of St. Peter. The belief that he is sole successor to Peter comes from the thought that Peter was appointed by Jesus in the New Testament as head of the church and ministered in Rome. The Pope is often seen or thought of as wearing a mitre. Within the Sistine Chapel in a meeting called the Conclave, the Cardinal Electors choose a new Pope. The meeting is called a Conclave, a word that in Latin means a room which may be locked. After the ballots are counted, they are burned in a stove in the Sistine Chapel. The smoke escapes through a small chimney. If the vote has been unsuccessful, the ballots are burned with a special chemical compound to make fumata nera, or black smoke. The Pope is also known as Vicarius Fili Day, which translates Vicar of Christ. Vicar is defined as a person who acts in place of another, a substitute, or a person who is authorized to perform the functions of another, a deputy. Dictionary.com provided the following example. God's Vicar on Earth. This claim alone is bizarre and insanely blasphemous, but there's more. The Catholic Church teaches that it is the continuation of the early community of followers of Christ established by Jesus, and it claims that its bishops are the successors to Jesus' disciples who lived in the first century AD in the province of Judea of the Roman Empire. By the end of the second century, bishops began congregating in regional synods to resolve doctrinal and policy issues. By the third century, the bishops of Rome began to act as a court of appeals for problems that other bishops could not resolve. In 380, under Emperor Theodosius, Christianity became the state religion of the Roman Empire by the decree of the Emperor. The definition of the word Catholic is universal or as a whole and church is defined as the body or organization of religious believers, the whole body of Christians. Therefore, Catholic Church literally translates into universal or whole body of Christians or follower of Christ. But is this actually the case? It is a well-known fact that the Catholic Church was known for persecuting Christians. 1260 years worth of persecuting Christians to be exact. But why? And what does the Bible actually say regarding Peter carrying on the work of Jesus Christ? Does the Bible mention the Pope? And if so, in what light? If there are any books in the Bible that will give us information regarding the identity of the Pope or God's supposed representative on earth, they would definitely be the books of Daniel and Revelation. This is because both the book of Daniel and Revelation 
play a huge part in the last day prophecies of planet Earth's history. Both the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation speak of not only the past, but the present and the future. They both display a promising depiction of where we are in prophetic times today. The book of Daniel was written by a young faithful steward who purposed in his heart not to defile himself and to stay faithful to God. Therefore, God rewarded his faithfulness with the gift of interpreting dreams and visions. A man named John, a disciple of Christ who had been banished and imprisoned on the island of Patmos for having the testimony of Jesus, is the author of the book of Revelation. Both Daniel and Revelation are full of symbols and metaphors which all have very real meanings and ideologies. Some that might be intimidating or confusing at first, but with prayer and very meticulous searching, the wise yet loving God of the Bible who promises that those who are true seekers of truth will find the truth, who also revealed these mysteries to Daniel and John for the sake of all his people can and will also reveal these mysteries to you. Daniel and Revelation both are so abundant with information that as I stated before, it will be impossible for me to cover it all in just one video of this time frame. However, it is my prayer and hope that today will be the start or a hefty addition to the journey for truth that you seek. Going forward with the identification of the beast, let us begin in Daniel chapter 7. We will title this information for category purposes, The Four Beast and the Little Horn. Daniel 7 is a continuation of Daniel 2, where God reveals the future to the king called Nebuchadnezzar in a dream. The dream consisted of a large statue of himself that had a head made of gold, chest and arms of silver, stomach and thighs of bronze, legs of iron, and feet partly of iron and clay. As Nebuchadnezzar gazed upon the statue, he then saw a stone that was cut without hands, strike the feet of the statue, causing it to crumble into dust that the wind blew away. Then the stone began to grow bigger and bigger until it filled the whole earth. In Daniel chapter 2, God reveals exactly what the statue, stone, and growth of the rock all mean. This was the dream, and now we will interpret it to the king. You, O king, are the king of kings. The God of heaven has given you dominion and power and might and glory. In your hands he has placed mankind and the beasts of the field and the birds of the air. Wherever they live, he has made you ruler over them all. You are that head of gold. After you, another kingdom will rise, inferior to yours. Next, a third kingdom, one of bronze, will rule over the whole earth. Finally, there will be a fourth kingdom, strong as iron, for iron breaks and smashes everything. And as iron breaks things to pieces, so it will crush and break all the others. Just as you saw that the feet and toes were partly of baked clay and partly of iron, so this will be a divided kingdom. 
yet it will have some of the strength of iron in it, even as you saw iron mixed with clay. As the toes were partly iron and partly clay, so this kingdom will be partly strong and partly brittle. And just as you saw the iron mixed with baked clay, so the people will be a mixture and will not remain united any more than iron mixes with clay. In the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to another people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it will itself endure forever. This is the meaning of the vision of the rock cut out of a mountain, but not by human hands. A rock that broke the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold to pieces. The great God has shown the king what will take place in the future. The dream is true, and the interpretation is trustworthy. Daniel chapter 2 explained that God had revealed the political future of the world to King Nebuchadnezzar. He showed him that there would never be another kingdom like his on the face of the earth. But more importantly, he showed him enormous evidence as to how planet Earth's history will end. The statue that was in Nebuchadnezzar's dream emphasized five ruling power kingdoms of the world and the order in which they would rule, beginning with Babylon, moving to Medo-Persia, then to Greece, next to Rome, and finally Europe divided. As we do know from our own planet's history, aside from the Bible, these powers in fact did rule the world in this order, even unto the present. However, we will see soon where Daniel specifically mentions Medo-Persia and Greece as the second and third world empires that rise and fall even as he moves into a surprising change when explaining what happens to the fourth kingdom. All of the three kingdoms that are mentioned prior to the fourth kingdom, Rome, were all displaced by the more powerful kingdoms which came after them, meaning they were conquered. However, Rome, or the fourth kingdom, broke that pattern. Rather than it being completely overtaken and conquered by a more powerful kingdom or a single superpower, the kingdom had become divided, just as was mentioned in Daniel 2 verse 41, which states, Yet it will have some of the strength of iron in it, even as you saw iron mixed with the clay, which is exactly what happened to Rome. The nations that now make up some or much of Europe, the Middle East, and Africa used to in fact belong to Rome. The prophecy explains that the kingdom will make many attempts to bind back together, but will be unsuccessful. Daniel 2 verse 43 and just as you saw the iron mixed with baked clay, so the people will be a mixture and will not remain united any more than iron mixes with clay. Rome has tried both political and military approaches via rulers such as Charles the Great, Napoleon, and even Hitler to merge the pieces of Europe back together again. All with no success, just as prophecy foretold. 
Daniel chapter 7 is a parallel prophecy of the same caliber. However, this time Daniel is having the dream and the imagery is different. Daniel's dream also reveals the history of the world, but it goes a step further in revealing the story of the people who are to preserve and share the pure testimony of Christ his salvation and his commandments. In Daniel's dream, he sees four beasts that rise out of a stormy sea. The four beasts that emerge from the sea correspond with the four kingdoms on the statue of Nebuchadnezzar. The first beast was like a lion and it had the wings of an eagle. This beast represented Babylon. The second beast looked like a bear and was raised up on one of its sides and it had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. This beast represented Medo-Persia. The third beast looked like a leopard and on its back it had four wings like those of a bird. It also had four heads and it represented Greece. The fourth beast which Daniel states was terrifying and frightening and very powerful had large iron teeth. It crushed and devoured its victims and trampled underfoot whatever was left. It was different from all the former beasts and it had ten horns. As Daniel continued to ponder about the horns, a little horn came up among them and three of the first horns were uprooted before it. This horn had eyes like the eyes of a human being and a mouth that spoke boastfully. The beast itself represents Rome. And just as the Iron Empire in Daniel 2 fragmented into feet of iron and clay, this beast's ten horns represent the nations that grew out of the Roman Empire as it aged and invading Germanic tribes melded into it. But what about the little horn? Daniel 2 ended with one final superpower and so does Daniel's dream in Daniel 7. The beast in Daniel's dream seems so vicious and terrifying that Daniel states his spirit troubled him. Daniel writes, I, Daniel, was troubled in spirit, and the visions that passed through my mind disturbed me. I approached one of those standing there and asked him the true meaning of all this. So he told me and gave me the interpretation of these things. The four great beasts are four kingdoms that will rise from the earth. But the saints of the Most High will receive the kingdom and will possess it forever, yes, forever and ever. Although Daniel had been reassured that the people of God would be victorious, he still needed understanding and wanted further explanation regarding the fourth beast and more specifically, the little horn that it grew. Daniel writes, Then I wanted to know the true meaning of the fourth beast, which was different from all the others and most terrifying, with its iron teeth and bronze claws, the beast that crushed and devoured its victims and trampled underfoot whatever was left. I also wanted to know about the ten horns on its head, and about the other horn that came up, before which three of them fell, the horn that looked more imposing than the others, and that had eyes and a mouth that spoke boastfully. As I watched, this horn was waging war against the saints and defeating them, until the Ancient of Days came and pronounced judgment in favor of the saints of the Most High, and the time came when they possessed the kingdom. He gave me this explanation. The fourth beast is a fourth kingdom that will appear on earth. It will be different from all the other kingdoms and will devour the whole earth, trampling it down and crushing it. The ten horns are ten kings who will come from this kingdom. After them another king will arise, different from the earlier ones. He will subdue three kings. 
He will speak against the Most High and oppress his saints and try to change the set times and the laws. The saints will be handed over to him for a time, times, and half a time. But the court will sit, and his power will be taken away and completely destroyed forever. Then the sovereignty, power, and greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven will be handed over to the saints, the people of the Most High. So before we continue, let us take what we have learned thus far from the book of Daniel and parallel it with the book of Revelation, chapter 13, which was written by a completely different author. Both Daniel and John are from two different time periods, but listen as John writes. And the dragon stood on the shore of the sea, and I saw a beast coming out of the sea. He had ten horns and seven heads, with ten crowns on his horns, and on each head a blasphemous name. The beast I saw resembled a leopard, but had feet like those of a bear, and a mouth like that of a lion. The dragon gave the beast his power and his throne, and great authority. One of the heads of the beast seemed to have had a fatal wound, but the fatal wound had been healed. The whole world was astonished and followed the beast. Men worshipped the dragon because he had given authority to the beast, and they also worshipped the beast and asked, Who is like the beast? Who can make war against him? The beast was given a mouth to utter proud words and blasphemies, and to exercise his authority for 42 months. He opened his mouth to blaspheme God and to slander his name and his dwelling place and those who live in heaven. He was given power to make war against the saints and to conquer them. And he was given authority over every tribe, people, language, and nation. All inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast. All whose names have not been written in the book of life belonging to the lamb that was slain from the creation of the world. He who has an ear, let him hear. Can you see the parallel imagery in these two visions by two very different people? What are some of the characteristics that can be used to identify this monstrosity of a beast? And do these characteristics point to the claim of the fourth beast identity being Rome, and more specifically, the Roman Catholic Church. What Revelation 13 tells us about this beast is, number one, it rises up out of the sea. Number two, it receives its power, seat, and authority from the dragon. Number three, it becomes a world power. Number four, it is guilty of blasphemy. Number five, it rules for 42 prophetic months. Number six, it receives a deadly wound that heals. Number seven, it is a religious power that receives worship. Number eight, it persecutes God's saints or his people. Number nine, has the mysterious number 666. Six, six. 
And finally, number 10, it is led by one supreme man. What Daniel 7 tells us about this beast is, we know that the fourth beast had 10 horns, which represents 10 kingdoms that split from Rome. These 10 kingdoms are also the same as the 10 toes that were represented on King Nebuchadnezzar's statue in Daniel chapter 2. History shows that from Rome, 10 tribes developed into the countries of modern Western Europe, while three were uprooted and destroyed as stated in Daniel 7 verse 20. Daniel 7 verse 20 states, I also wanted to know about the ten horns on its head and about the other horn that came up before which three of them fell. These ten kingdoms were Spain, England, France, Germany, Switzerland, Italy, Portugal, but the Heruli, Ostrogoths, and Vandals all fell before they were able to be made kingdoms. So it is clear that the beast that Revelation in Daniel is speaking of is Rome. But what about Rome makes it the beast? As we look through all of the traits, they all point to one power, with the head being found in the smallest country on earth. Vatican City. It is none other than the Pope himself. This power fits the description of all ten accusations that God himself holds him guilty of. First, this power rose out of the sea, or as the Bible describes, a large populated nation of people which is further explained in Revelation chapter 17. Next, the dragon gave the Pope its power and position. We know the dragon is Satan. Revelation 20 verse 1 says, then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hands the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain. And he seized the dragon, the ancient serpent, who is the devil and Satan. But how does Satan specifically give power to Rome? Well, the Bible answers this. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads, and his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered to devour her child as soon as it was born. And she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. The Bible is speaking of Mary giving birth to Jesus and King Herod sending out soldiers to kill him. Yes, it was King Herod that commanded physically to kill the male babies in effort to find and kill Jesus. But according to the Bible, it was Satan who spiritually inspired it. History shows us that King Herod, King of Judea, 
was ruled and governed under Roman province and pagan Rome turned over its power and capital city to none other than the Church of Rome. Then we are told it becomes a worldwide power. There is no question that the Catholic Church or Papacy was a worldwide power during the Middle Ages and still has its hands in world affairs today. And in fact, in the beginning of this video, we learned that the word Catholic itself means universal. Next, we know it speaks blasphemies against the Most High. The Bible describes blasphemies as claiming to be able to forgive sins. The Bible also describes the claim to be God as blasphemy. The following is a quote made by a member of the papacy. The papacy also claims that the Pope is equal with God. Next we know that he rules for 42 prophetic months. The Bible tells us that a day is equal to one year in prophetic timing. This means 42 months is equivalent to 1,260 years. The worldwide power of Papal Rome became official in AD 538, when Emperor Justinian's decree making the papacy supreme was no longer opposed. The papacy was dealt what appeared to be a death blow in the year 1798 when the Pope was captured by Napoleon's general, Alexander Berthier, ending his dominating reign with a seemingly deadly wound. And from AD 538 to the year 1798, there are exactly 1,260 years that occur in this time frame. But the Bible then says his deadly wound would be healed. And it is so obvious that that is exactly the case. People gather from far and wide to see the Pope and receive his blessing. From the President of the United States to many other world leaders, the Pope is loved and respected almost everywhere that he goes. Here is a quote from Joseph Rickaby, the modern papacy lectures on the history of religion. The Pope is the best known person of the 20th century, has formed personal relationships with the leaders of 91 countries, and is prepared for worldwide rule now. Wow. We are also told it is a religious power. The Church of Rome is a country and political power, but is also a religious power and demands or receives worship, causing people all over the world to wander after it. But we are told that it was given power to make war with the saints and to persecute them. It is known that a common practice among the papacy was to persecute and destroy Christians who spoke out against them in the name of ridding heresy. Particularly during the Middle Ages, the peak period of its control, many historians say that more than 50 million people died for their faith during this period of persecution. And tribulation and lastly we are shown that his number is 666 God gives us a miraculous clue when he warns for us to count the number of the beast's name and that it is the number of a man 
we learn that one of the Pope's official titles written in Latin is Vicarious Fili Dei, which means Vicar of Christ. But when added together as Roman numerals, his name comes out to the number 666. Clearly the papacy is the beast that gives the mark. And we learned in What is the Mark of the Beast, part one, that the mark was sun worship or sun day worship. And the seal of God was God's whole law, including his seventh day Sabbath that was removed, blotted out, and changed by the papacy. But is God's law still even relevant? How did God's law become changed? And is a day even that important?